This past two weeks, the theme of our summer Bible school was Upward Bound. And, of course, the ultimate goal is heaven. But as the hymn talks about, not just a matter of heaven, but not dwelling where all these doubts and fears dismay, growing in Christ, living the Christian life, upward bound in our journey as we travel through the wilderness. And, of course, Israel, whom we're studying right now, was traveling through the wilderness. And they weren't always upward bound. As we'll see today, some of them were quite earthly bound and focused on temporal things rather than on the things that make for a godly life. Now, last week, we almost finished our study of Rephidim. We've been looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. And today, I hope that we'll finish rebellion test number four, which is at Rephidim, which taught us lessons about prayer and spiritual warfare. We've been looking at a study of the last description of the demonic forces that we fight in our daily lives in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Spiritual warfare and prayer. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the last description that is given of these demonic, angelic beings. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now, what we've learned so far is that spiritual wickedness in high places is from the Greek verbal and noun forms of paneria and paneros, which means depraved, degenerate, vicious, malicious, and lewd. In Ephesians 6, it's a reference to all the host under the leadership of the echelons of power and authority that Paul had just discussed. The focus of that word is on the moral decadence and the permeating evil of the character of the demonic host. They reflect the evil character of their leader, the evil one, just as the holy angels reflect the righteous moral character of their leader, the Holy One of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paneros is not merely sin, that's hamartia, which means to miss the mark. But wickedness is not an act, but an intrinsic character quality of deliberate depravity. It's the deliberate attempt to defile the moral standards of God. In fact, it's the central controlling immoral character quality of Satan, just as holiness is the central controlling moral character quality of God. The word for wickedness or evil is visibly shown by the continuous wicked acting of the totally depraved evil nature of Satan and his followers, both demonic and human. We're not merely wrestling with good people whose ideas need to change. God says that Satan and his followers, both angelic and human, are decadent, defiled, and perversely evil. They're not ignorant of what is good. They've deliberately chosen to rebel against God's moral standards and his divinely revealed order of holiness. You see that in the modern perversions of sexuality that surround us today. You recall that when the Supreme Court handed down the Obergefell decision permitting so-called gay marriage, I publicly warned you here, and it was over the internet, and I, I preached it in many different places, I publicly warned you that polygamy would be next. Yesterday I got a news release that the new boundary being pushed by the American LBGT community is polygamy. You see, they don't really care just about same-sex relationships. They want to defile every possible way what God has established in his word. Last week I included a bulletin insert about the recent Canadian ruling where a judge approved a three-person so-called marriage relationship. You see, in this war there are only two options. Either you are engaged in the fight or you are being deceived and lulled to sleep by the devil until he can destroy you. The Bible makes it clear that the entire world and the world system is evil and under the control of Satan, the evil one. 1 John 5, 18 and 19, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one, Satan, toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. 
Last week I pointed out that immediately following the warning about the wicked one and the whole world lying in wickedness, that the last verse of 1 John warns against idolatry because that is the very next test that Israel faced in the wilderness wanderings, the golden calf, and that's what we hope to get into today. Last verse, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. The whole world lieth in wickedness under the control of the wicked one in the preceding verses, and they love it. It makes them feel good. When you preach against their wickedness, they get violently angry and try to shut you up. When you preach righteousness and living a holy life, they want to kill you because they can't stand the contrast. And we saw last week, that's exactly why Cain killed Abel, Abel because he was specifically motivated, and he also is called the wicked one in that text, 1 John 3, 12, not as Cain who was of that wicked one and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. First, we summarize the verses that teach us pious religious leaders can be wicked, clearly under the control of the devil. After debating the Pharisees and other religious leaders on defilement, Jesus explained how his teaching applied to the inner man, including inner wickedness. And we saw that over in Matthew chapter 7. Externals are a manifestation of the heart and soul. Second, we saw that Paul uses the same word to describe humanity at large outside of Christ. And he makes homosexuality the prime example of wickedness. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through 32. He talks about how men exchange their affection for men, women exchange their natural affection, uh, and they like women instead. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness. Wickedness. And he closes, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do that. Do that. Third, we saw the thing that should most greatly concern us is Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 5 that a believer can also have internal wickedness worthy of death. The context, of course, implies the Lord's table there. And it's a specific directive. Listen to me carefully. It's a specific directive to exercise church discipline on the church member who is manifesting the wickedness of his heart by specific sins. There are six of them that are listed. Fornication, covetousness, idolatry, railing, drunkenness, and extortion. Paul says in those six cases, you should be turning that church person over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. One of those is the word for railing. I told you last week what that word is. Lodoria. Or loidos. It means to slander. It means reviling, fault finding. Invective, scolding, denunciation, blame. Going on a tirade. Castigation. Censure, blame, loud abusive speech, abusive accusations, vituperation. In other words, in English, giving somebody a tongue lashing or screaming and yelling and carrying on with your hands waving and stomping your feet as you take out your feelings about somebody else and spit in their face. Railing falls into the same category as fornication, into the same category as idolatry, which is the very next thing we're going to be studying, <clears throat> the golden calf, the wilderness wanderings, and it's subject to church discipline and exclusion from the church. Some of you may criticize others for their sex sins, but you fail to self-examine yourselves for the sin of railing. But the sex sins are important. There's been some of it here. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and following. It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Everybody knows about it. 
Paul had heard about it and he wasn't even there. That's how common the report was. Everybody on the outside knew about it too. Such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife and you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. Now listen to verses 4 and 5. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when ye are gathered together, who is the church assembled, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's with his authority, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Jesus. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Do you know how many times the Apostle Paul refers back to what was going on with Israel in the wilderness wanderings? What was going on with Israel at the Exodus? 1 Corinthians 5 is based on that. That's what we're studying right now. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. There's our word. You ought not to be fellowshipping with, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you an epistle not to company with fornicators. Now, fornicators is a broader word than adultery. Fornication includes all sexual immorality with any person or thing outside of the biblically listed category of marriage. Adultery deals only with marriage. Fornication, all other forms of perversion. I wrote to you an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world. In other words, you know, you can't isolate yourselves as some Christians have done and thought we will only, we will never have contact with the outside world. We'll just be in our little box here and nobody will ever know that we're even Christians because we're hiding out. So no, that's not what God called you to do. You're going to have contact with those people. In fact, the whole world lieth in, come on, hear it, wickedness. Obviously, the whole world is involved in that kind of defilement. And he lists the bunch of them. Fornicators, covetousness, idolatry. He says, you, you can't to get out of the world because then you must needs go out of the world. For, but now I've written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat because that's one of the very basic ways we have fellowship that's the communion also it's the koinonia, the, the way in which we get together and share the memory of Christ's death. For what have I to do to judge them also without? That is, all the people out there in the world, the fornicators of the world, the covetous, the extortioners, the idolaters, because you'd have to go out of the world. So what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? Look at verse 13. But them that are without God judgeth. Now, what are you supposed to do? Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. In other words, it's somebody in the church. In other words, what God says is throw them out of the church and then pray that God will use the devil to kill them. Now, those are strong words, folks. 
How many churches do you know that have ever done that? Throw them out and then pray that God will use the devil to kill them. Remember what the New Testament teaches about the ten failures of Israel and the other examples given in the Old Testament. It says with many of them, speaking of all these people in the Old Testament, verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. In other words, God killed them. Paul's talking about that in chapter 5, five chapters earlier. Pray that he will do the same with wicked people that defile the church. Specifically what Paul taught in chapter 5, just five chapters earlier. You say, well, yeah, but I mean, does it really apply? Okay, look at verse 6. Now, these things were our examples. Do you understand why we're studying the ten failures of Israel, the ten points of rebellion of Israel in the wilderness? Because God specifically says multiple times in the New Testament, those things are examples for us. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. It's God's warning shot across the bow that if this goes on in the church, you're going to get the same results that Israel got in the wilderness. Neither be idolaters. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? We talked first about the lust problem. Now we're talking about idolatry. And that's the very next problem that we're going to see in these ten tests of Israel. As were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand Commit fornication. Having sex outside of marriage. Let me pause on that example for just a minute. Do you remember what happened? It's over in Numbers chapter 25. And behold, one of the children of Israel, this is the matter of Baal Peor, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses, leadership, and in the sight of of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now think about that for just a second. I mean, talk about chutzpah. Now here is Israel getting judged by God because after all, there's, you know, this gross immorality going on in God's people. Balaam couldn't figure out a way to get God to curse them, but he told Balak, king of Moab, I know how God himself will judge them. We'll just get the pretty little Moabitish girls and they'll go down there into the camp of Israel and the boys will start fooling around with them and they'll start getting them into worship of their Moabitish gods and you know what? God won't put up with that and he'll kill them. <laughs> Balak took his advice and he sent the girls down. And here's this Jewish boy. He was a prince. He thought he could do what he wanted because he was a bigwig. And when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation. So he's there praying with the rest of them. And they watch, and this guy comes dragging this Midianitish girl. Everybody's praying around and looking and weeping and <laughs> snoots his nose and walks into a tent. Saw it, and he rose up from among the congregation. And he in his hand, and he went after the land of Israel into his tent, and he thrust them both through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel, and those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phineas the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed them not from the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore I say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Now the name of the Israelite that was slain even that was slain with the Midianitish woman was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of the chief house among the Simeonites. 
And the name of the Midianitish woman that was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zur. He was head over a people and a chief of the chief house in Midian. And Moses, and Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Vex the Midianites and smite them, for they vex you with their wiles. Wherewith they have beguiled in the matter of Peor and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the prince of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague for Peor's sake. Did you get it? The people were right outside the tabernacle, praying that God would clean up the whoredom that was going on in Israel. And one bold-faced jerk had the goal to pull a woman into the tent right in front of the tabernacle and proceeded to have sex with her. Phineas ripped, op ripped open the door of the tent and stabbed them both with a javelin, pinning them to the ground in a tent right outside the tabernacle. That's like some wicked jerk taking a woman over here into the school building right next to this church and having several people watch. Today you can't kill them like God commanded Israel to do and then blessed Phineas for actually doing it. Instead, what God says to do today is throw them out of the church. Get rid of them. Don't let them come back. And pray for their death. He tells us through the Apostle Paul to turn them over to the devil and let the devil kill them. Specifically, Paul tells us here that the matter of Baal Peor was an example for us. So start praying now that God will kill any wicked people in this church that are doing the same kind of thing. Reject them entirely. Have no contact with them at all. Turn them over to the devil now so that the devil can kill them. Paul says to do it when the church is gathered. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Anyone who has done like Zimri and Cosby in this church, we turn them over to Satan right now as a church and pray that as your final instrument of chastening, Satan will kill them. Father, we pray that you will cleanse this church from this horrifying kind of wickedness. For the whole world lieth in wickedness. And sometimes even believers are controlled by the wicked one. And so we pray that you will kill such. We turn them over to Satan. Under the authority of Jesus Christ and in his name. Amen. Paul goes on with the examples of wickedness that God found among his own people. Neither let us tempt Christ, verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 10. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. And then he reminds us again. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And then he gives a very serious warning. You say, well, that doesn't bother me. I'm not involved in that stuff. Listen to the warning. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You say, oh, it doesn't apply to me. I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. And then, as you know, one of my favorite verses in the New Testament, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You know, everybody faces this kind of stuff. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able? He never puts some burden on you that's bigger than you are. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it? 
People, the whole world lieth in wickedness. We've been called to do battle. Spiritual warfare and prayer, that is the, the message of Rephidim. Peter says the same thing and uses homosexuality as one of the three prime examples. For if God spared not the angels that sinned but cast them down to hell, so there's example number one, and delivered them in chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now here comes example number two, and spared not the old world but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of, upon the world of the ungodly. Now look, were those two big judgments? Those are not Mickey Mouse judgments, you know, and God says, well, I'll use one of the small judgments to show you. First, he talks about all of the fallen host of Satan and what he's doing with them. Bam! That's a pretty big judgment. Second illustration is the worldwide flood in the days of Noah. God saved eight people. Is that a big illustration? You bet it is. Look at his third illustration. It's the illustration that applies to America today. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow. Now look at the last phrase. Making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. To make sure we don't miss the point, that destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was an example for us today, and God repeats it in the epistle of Jude. Verse 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, Sodom, Gomorrah, Edma, Zeboim, and Zohar, which is a small one where a lot escaped, giving themselves over to fornication. Hmm, fornication. Sex outside of marriage. Any kind of weird, perverted stuff. And going after strange flesh, and you know what they were doing at Sodom, are set forth for an example. And in case you've ever missed it before, because you read through the Bible and didn't see hell there, look at the next part of the verse. Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. God does not want his people involved in the perversions of the world. And that goes for all fornication, immoral relationships outside the context of a pure, godly marriage. By closing on the note of spiritual wickedness in high places, that completes our study of Rephidim, wilderness test number four. Rephidim was when God tested Israel how to do spiritual warfare and the necessity of prayer. I hope you've learned through our study that the principles God is teaching from Israel's war with Amalek are the same principles that we must use today. If we fail in this test, we will also die in the wilderness as Israel did. The tests God gave to Israel were designed to teach the church by example. Remember what Paul says about fornication in the church, throw them out, Turn them over to the devil to kill as a warning to everyone else in the church. That brings us to rebellion test number five, and we have time to get started. Great. Rebellion test number five, which was at Horeb, that's the golden calf, that's in Exodus 32. We tend to think of that as the big one, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Exodus 32. But all ten points of the rebellion nailed the coffin of Israel closed in the wilderness deaths. Exodus 32, beginning in verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Hmm, he's thinking, well, how can I do this? Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. And, had made, and after he had made a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. 
And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast unto Jehovah. Notice, it's all capital L-O-R-D. That means the name Yahweh, Jehovah, is the Hebrew word in the text. Using the right name, but sure not using the right methods. And they rose up early on the morrow, and they offered burnt offerings, and they brought peace offerings. Notice, they knew all the different things to do. They knew what they were supposed to do mechanically when they're worshiping God. They brought the different kinds of offerings that you're supposed to bring to God. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Paul quotes that over there. We just read it over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, God can see what's going on down there. Moses couldn't. Moses is seeking the face of the Lord. Go, get thee down for thy people. Isn't that interesting? For thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. God holds leadership accountable. How is leadership going to respond? And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf. They have worshipped it. They have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Moses didn't need a tape recorder down there or a CD recorder or something to find out what was going on. Later he sat down and listened to the tape. God had a perfect recording of it, and God quoted it to Moses. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 12, 31, Every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For with thy words thou shalt be justified, and with thy words thou shalt be condemned. God knows every word you've ever spoken, every thought that's ever gone through your heart. He's got a record of it. For Moses' sake, God played the record back. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Now, God has already told Moses what they said and did. And God says, now, how are you going to respond to that, Moses? Moses. I'm going to go kill them. And Moses begs for them. I have seen this people. Behold, our stick enough people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation. Ah, there's something in it for Moses. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? In other words, God, it wasn't me that did it. I couldn't have done this by myself. You're the God who did it. You're the one that called them your people. You're the one that delivered them from Egypt. You're the one that sent the ten plagues. You're the one that split the, the Red Sea in half. You're the one that's led them through the wilderness. You're the one that's fed them. You're the one that's provided the water for them with the rock that followed them, which Paul tells us is Christ. They're your people. Wherefore, should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out. In other words, the world will always turn around what takes place and blame it on God. For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self. God, you've made some promises. Oh, Lord, you made a promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, here calling him Israel, Prince of God. And said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give to your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. He reminded him of the promises of God. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. The first thing we learn about this test deals with the issue of, are you ready? 
It's because we have a lot of people here who fit this test. Deals with the issue of impatience. Remember verse 1? When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron. They sent a committee. It wasn't just one or two who were griping about it. They said, look, let's, let's do this thing in an organized manner because we want to win. And they said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And man, he wandered off someplace. We don't know what's happened to him. People demanding action. People demand action and feel good entertainment. That characterizes the modern neo-evangelical and charismatic churches today. They want their rock music and their worship bands. They don't really care about leadership that's taken a courageous stand against Pharaoh and all the Pharaohs of this world. They get impatient with leadership that makes them wait. They get impatient with leadership that is seeking the face of God as Moses was. They recognize intellectually what the leader has done, quote, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt. And they say that, but it's like that's nothing. And they don't have to be grateful for it at all. I mean, do you understand what it took for Moses standing by himself in front of Pharaoh and the embarrassment that he might have felt by holding a stick up over the Red Sea and nothing happening? And him being the first one to start walking between these gigantic walls of water that were 600 feet tall on each side of him, which we learned from discussing where the exodus took place. We don't know what happened to this guy. Him leading him through the wilderness. Him praying to the Lord and God providing water. We don't know about it. He's not important. You know, that's nothing. We don't have to be grateful for it. They really don't care what happens to their leader as long as they get what they want. They're ready to leave him in a heartbeat if they think somebody else can give them something that they can see and enjoy better. They're willing to commission somebody to, quote, make it up as you go along rather than waiting for God to reveal himself. Impatience. They hate the thought of patience because it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about patience because that is one of the prime tests that Israel failed. Jesus talks about it as he talks about sowing seed. And you know the different seed falls on different ground. And Luke 8, 15 says, But that on the good ground are they which with an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it. Now listen to the last phrase. And bring forth fruit with patience. You know, that's tough, isn't it? Every day you get up and you say, okay, Lord, help me through the day. And you begin to run into the different things that are hanging you up and slowing you down and making it hard for you to do your stuff. And you start to get impatient. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, patience, meekness, faith, temperance. All of a sudden, Satan has taken his thorn and he's poked it into your balloon in the area called patience and it deflates and you are impatient man I wish that preacher would finish today I don't like to hear that dear people here's one of the keys to Israel's failure with the golden calf it's the first Thing that's mentioned in the text. What does Jesus tell us to do in Luke 21, 19? In patience, possess ye your souls. 
You say, yeah, yeah, but it's uncomfortable. I, I don't like to have to wait around. I, I want it now, you know? I, I live in that generation where, where you can get it instantly. You whip out your device, whatever it is, and you poke in a few things on it, and suddenly, bingo, there pops up on your screen, and you got it. You don't have to wait for it. And so it's uncomfortable. Well, Paul has something to say about that. He tells you that's how you get it. Romans 5, 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh, say it with me, patience. Tribulation worketh what? Yeah. You see, that's why we don't like to be patient, because we know it's hard. We know it's going to be uncomfortable. God says, I'm going to develop in you patience. I'm going to make you bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is patience. Let's see, what is the best tool I've got around here? Looking through his toolbox. What's the best tool I've got around here so that I can help that Christian down there at Bible Presbyterian Church in Collingswood, New Jersey? Hey, my name is Christian. That Christian down there in Bible Presbyterian what tool am I going to use to develop in him patience? Oh, no, Lord, not that. God says, yes, that. When you learn it, then I'll kind of release that one, relax that one a little bit, because I want to develop in you the rest of the fruit of the Spirit as well. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, patience. I'll, I'll, I'll get them all out there. But the way I'm going to develop patience in you, remember we're talking about Israel in the Old Testament. What was God using as he dragged them through the wilderness? Was that a tough experience? Yes or no? If you say yes, nod your head up and down. If you say no, wiggle it back and forth. Yes, okay, everybody's nodding up and down. Tribulation work with patience. But Israel refused to be patient. Well, let's become a Moses. That guy that led us out of Egypt, as though that was nothing. You know, we, we need some gods. Something to, to make us feel good. Something we can bow down and worship. In verse 4, Paul says, if you get that one, then you get experience. Tribulation work with patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. He picks up that idea of hope over in chapter 8, three chapters later. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with, what do you guess the next word is? Patience. Wait for it. In other words, God isn't just bringing trouble to make you not feel very good. God is developing in you a world view. Based on the promises of God, you've got hope. You're going through the trouble, but now he says, for if, for hope that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? You say, Lord, I know what's on the other end because you promised it. How about chapter 15, verse 4? And what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Now, wait a minute. The things that were dealing with the stuff that happened before. Do you think he might be talking about things that happened in the Old Testament? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Remember, he's just told us over in 1 Corinthians that those things were written as examples for us. So now he says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. It's designed to teach us something. You know what the next phrase says? That through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. The very first part of the golden calf test was the test of patience. And because they failed the test of patience, they made the golden calf. Our time's up. Oh, we have a lot more to say about this one. There's an incredible test that Israel faced and that Aaron faced as a subordinate leader. He wasn't number one, but he was number two. But he had always leaned on Moses. 
Now Moses is not around, and now he's got a big group of people in front of him, and he's thinking to himself, what in the world am I going to do? I've got to figure out something that I can do uh, that'll keep the people happy. Got to keep the people happy. Who cares whether the people are happy? The issue is, is God happy with what you're doing? Long time ago, back in high school, I came to the conclusion, I don't care what people think. I only care what God thinks. Because ultimately, he's the only one that matters. Well, our time is up. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you that these things were, that happened aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Father, we thank you that your word has declared to us how we should live, which includes not only our actions, but also the way in which we respond to the circumstances in which we find ourselves, because Israel faced all of those things in the Old Testament. And you recorded those and all the principles that deal with them so that we might make the right choices and not the wrong choices, which ended in the death of the first generation who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Father, we pray that you will take your word and your word alone and apply it to our hearts in such a way that you bring us to repentance, to true faith in Christ, to true obedience, obedience to Christ, not in the power of the flesh, but in the power of the Spirit of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is, I will sing of my Redeemer, number 517. Let's stand to sing.